from Kroll. This is the Security Concepts Podcast. Today's podcast is one that we think is going to be of great import to a lot of our business clients. This one's going to cover the great increase in retail theft that we've seen all over the news and we're hearing about every day. To cover this, we brought in three experts. Two are lifelong retail security experts, and one is a former chief of police at the Boston Police Department. So we can cover aspects from both elements when we're really looking at what some of the causes and some of the things that could be done to mitigate some of this risk. Brought along a podcast regular, Danny Linsky, and a pair of Steves. I've got Steve Palumbo and Steve Powers, both have been in retail at the highest level, uh, managing security of all aspects, and uh, are here to kind of share some of their information with us. I'm going to go ahead and start with a question for Steve Powers, because he lives in a market that is heavily impacted by a lot of this retail theft. And he came from one of the highest profile retailers in the world that has had a lot of issues with this type of theft in their spaces. Steve, uh, can you give us just a little bit of background on some of the data, some of what we're seeing now with this great increase in retail theft? Well, thank you, Jeff. Good morning. Um, as you noted, um, I'm based in the Pacific Northwest, and there's been a huge issue with um, retail theft crime, and is specifically coming out of organized retail crime theft rings. Uh, there's been a lot of good research by a number of uh, organizations to include the National Retail Foundation and the Retail Industry Leaders Association and the Retail Industry Leaders Association report um, that really has the most recent data um, covering 20, uh, that came out in 2021 um, noted kind of some very staggering and sobering statistics. Uh, there were nearly $69 billion worth of products were stolen from retailers in 2019 alone. Um, they estimate that U.S. retail crime results in uh, approximately $125.7 billion in lost economic activity. And then on top of that, the federal and state governments view their impact as at least $15 billion in lost personal business tax revenues, such as lost sales taxes. So it's a huge problem. Uh, more recently, the National Retail Foundation in um, 2022 reported that retail crime now costs retailers an average of $700,000 per $1 billion in sales. And that's huge. And quite honestly, um, the smaller retailers have not um, been able to absorb those loss losses and many small businesses have had to close. With those startling figures in mind, why don't we bring in Danny and the other Steve to talk a little bit about some of the law enforcement response, the prosecutorial response, and really the retail providers, security departments responses to this type of increase in retail thefts. Jeff, I, th I think it starts with, you know, a change in the justice system. A couple of years ago, when we were looking at disparate impacts in the justice system, prosecutors were running for office and they were saying as part of their their agenda was that they were no longer going to prosecute low-level crimes and it seemed like you know well-intentioned right the mother who is shoplifting for her children to get food that's probably not what we need to put police resources and someone we shouldn't put be putting into the justice system right that's somebody we should be wrapping services around and trying to make sure that she doesn't have to steal for food for her kids and I think everyone agreed that that would be a good thing. However, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. We've got people who are who are drug addicted and, you know, need to get several hundred dollars a day to take care of their habit instead of getting treatment. Since they're not getting treatment, they're utilizing these retail thefts to, to supplement their drug habits. And um, they're going to continue to do that until they either get sober or they're held in consequences for, for legal actions. Um, and... There's now retail groups that are targeting, you know, it's not that they need them, but they're going in and they're smashing retail store windows and taking high-end jewelry, high-end handbags, high-end shoes, uh, coats, whatever it is, and selling them on the black market, uh, sometimes taking orders beforehand as to what exactly people want uh, and going on and stealing them. So I think 
the, the justice system and the tenor and tone wanting to not prosecute individuals for small petty crimes has emboldened me. You know, take whatever you want and sell it. There's no consequences to my action. So why wouldn't I? And Danny, I totally agree. And there's a couple other things on the other side of the of the aisle here that, that's kind of also feeding into this. You know, um, one, crime for a very long time was on the decline. Uh, retailers were not seeing the level of, of theft that they had seen in years past. And so as a, as a result of that, as, you know, as running their businesses, they cut back on their security department. So they're, st they're not staffed to the levels they were, say, a decade ago. You know, they're, 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 they're much smaller security teams now. And also, due to liability concerns, they've issued what they basically call hands-off policies uh, on shoplifting. So they're not as aggressively enforcing um, apprehending shoplifters at the store level as they used to as well. So you combine, you know, the cutback in, 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 in staffing with the kind of less aggressive <laughs> posture in terms of apprehending shoplifters with what's going on on the legal side of the coin. And that's where you have this sort of perfect storm and you're seeing what you're seeing happening now. Going back to the corporate policies of disengaging and basically observing and reporting only, part of that resulted from the perpetrators using greater levels of violence and aggression um, that had not been seen before. So that kind of led to this, the problem just getting worse and magnified. And, and Jeff, you know, you know, as a former law enforcement officer, police have to take some of this on as well. Uh, you know, I've dealt with clients who are trying to deal with these issues and they're trying to hire police officers on overtime to come in and secure the stores. And, um, Basically, some of the messaging from the police officers was, well, well, we can't arrest anyone anymore because the prosecutors won't prosecute them. Well, that's that's not the case. The laws are still on the books. If, if people want to change the law, then they, they can do that, right? But the, the reason shoplifting laws actually came into effect is because retailers got together and said, hey, we have to do something. Otherwise, we can't stay in business and we can't keep people uh, employed if this is the business model, if anyone can come in here and steal and there's no consequences. So that's why we have these shoplifting laws with you know, arrest is an option in the first place because retailers were getting killed and police officers have to still do their job. Uh, they may not like it that the prosecutor is not prosecuting the case and the person's going to walk out the, the court the next day. However, you taking that person, putting them in custody, having to go through the booking process, creating a record that when people say what's going on and why is this the problem? Why are we having all these issues of disorder and concern in this neighborhood? Well, you know, it might be the fact that we arrest these people. They've been in the justice system 40, 50 times, and there's been no consequences that has emboldened them to continue their actions. If nothing else, if I know I'm going to get arrested in, in Sector A, where, where uh, Officer Linsky's working, but I'm not going to get arrested in Sector B, where Officer Jones is working, well, guess what? I'm probably going to avoid getting arrested if I can and go to the place where they, uh, they aren't taking enforcement action. So police have to continue to, you know, hold the, the prosecutor's feet to the fire if they don't want to do their job. And coordinate with the merchants to make sure that uh, they're taking, you know, good steps to uh, to try and prevent this when they can, and report it. Uh, and let's get a handle on exactly how big the problem is. It's fascinating stuff. So we're basically at the point where we have this perfect storm of lack of retail staffing, lack of retail desire to enforce their own uh, policies that may be on uh, shoplifting, lack of prosecutorial agenda to actually prosecute these people for shoplifting and really the lack of the law enforcement being able to one staff the positions and also uh, arrest these people because they've seen the same things over and over and over again so we're at the position now where these retailers have spent three years now trying to live through some of the hardest times they've seen and now they're getting impacted by yet another uh, issue where they can't really keep their doors open because their product keeps walking off the shelves any uh, other uh, items you guys might have to impart on our uh, people about uh, what what they can do, what they should be doing outside of uh, trying to get some more government help uh, with these types of things? What do those retail people really need to do right now to try to uh, tighten up this whole situation? Most major retailers now have organized retail crime units within their within their departments, and those units are all communicating with each other. So there is a lot of information sharing going on right now. And what it's also doing is, you know, that's driving, you know, some of the pressure um, towards the local governments to say, look, you know, you need to start you need to start enforcing these laws. 
because they're all gathering this information. So if five or six retailers can get together and show the amount of loss they're, they're experiencing because of this, and they're gathering this information mostly through these OOC groups that work, you know, that work within the companies, they gather that information and they go forward to that with their local officials and say, look, this is what something needs to be done because, you know, we're constituents as well and we're being victimized here on a regular basis and no one's doing anything about it. That's, that seems to be helping as well. Uh, more locally, um, as recent as uh, June 21st in 2022, um, the state Ad attorney general in the state of Washington, Bob Ferguson, uh, revealed the following statistic and stated that retailers statewide lost a combined total of $2.7 billion worth of goods to organized retail theft in 2021 alone. And upon releasing that statistic, he announced that the state would be um, establishing an organized retail theft task force that involved not only local law enforcement, but private security, state law enforcement, the Washington State Patrol, and to include resources from the federal government. Yeah, and I think the retailers, too, need to put some pressure you know, on these elected officials in these in these areas where this is happening, you know, a lot, and you you're because you're seeing what's happening. I mean, re, there are retailers that are just pulling out of certain cities just because of this issue, you know, and that's you know that's less tax dollars, that's less jobs, that's less everything. That hurts everybody, and that's the message I think that the retailers need to bring to their elected officials in in these areas that are get, that are being decimated by this by this problem. Is we're just not going to do business here if you don't help us. You know, we're we're just going to pull up stakes and leave. And that doesn't help anybody. And who really suffers, unfortunately, is the people in those neighborhoods who need those services. You know, if, if a food store or a drug store is pulling out of a neighborhood and people now have to travel even farther to get their food or their medicine, that's not good for anyone. And that's the message I think these retailers need to bring to these government officials and say, look, you need to help us. You know, we need to do something. We need to work together because if not, we're just going to leave. And that's because that's what they're doing. Yeah, Steve, I think another thing we can ask the community to do to ask our customers to do is to you know put some some messaging up put some signage you know maybe even give them a flyer or you know on the back of their seat hey if you're seeing somebody who's stealing from my store can you please alert one of our customer care folks um, so that we can address it right and that way you've got more eyes in the store uh, people will re realize that's the program that people I don't know if there's a way you can incentivize that to, to customers who help you uh, recover items that were stolen or someone who's targeting uh, your store for theft but um, changing that environment where people feel like, you know, the whole world is looking at them in a negative manner if they're doing negative things and stealing um, might be one way to kind of address this issue as well. More of a training aspect too, you know, you know, yeah, there's a hands-off policy, you know, with you from liability reasons, which probably there should be, but you train your staffs on different, different methods of deterring this type of theft and apprehending in a safe manner training your your retail staff the people in the store how to spot this kind of stuff and how to deter it in a safe way you know uh do we talk stuff we talked about previously you know good customer service is your best deterrent always so invest more in training not only to your security teams but into your staffs as a whole to uh further expound on what my colleague steve palumbo referenced in the areas of training i believe there's a huge opportunity um for personal safety and awareness training for employees. Kind of one of the silent, the silent victims of all this activity have been the employees that have not only witnessed these actions by organized crime gangs, as well as the day-to-day, -day, daily incidents you know, every hour something happened where they're either a customer's reporting or they're observing um, and witnessing the activity themselves takes a tremendous emotional toll on employees and provide and causes uh, a tremendous amount of anxiety, um, fear, um, probably leading to potentially post traumatic stress. Uh, and so one of the things beyond many of the employee assistant programs that are out there that almost every employer has to some 
to some degree is actually focused training on how to potentially address these issues and from a personal safety standpoint. And what I mean by that is how to disengage, how to remain safe, um, potentially in those cases where they might be forced to de-escalate a situation. There's a variety of programs um, that are offered by by a lot of companies and specifically by Kroll in terms of how an employee should behave and act during a situation that is high risk, highly emotionally charged, and how to remain successful. And it goes well beyond the traditional training of just customer service. So they're very targeted um, programs that deal specifically with crime type issues and making sure that employees and customers remain safe. That's always at the forefront of everything we want to do and teach. All excellent points, gentlemen. I really appreciate all three of you coming on the podcast and talking to us about this pretty pressing issue for a lot of businesses out there. I also want to thank all of our listeners and invite you to go ahead and subscribe on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast so you can get us every time. Our next episode is actually going to be about threat management on the campus environment, the college campus environment, and it should be fascinating. We'll see you then. Thank you.